Hello, and welcome to the Truth Doctrine Podcast, where we discuss all things esoteric, occult, divine, and obscure. My name is Mikey, and I will be presenting to you information that is important to the development of human consciousness. I hope you're ready for that. So, today, this is my first video, so any critiques that you may have, please leave them below whether it's on Rumble or YouTube or wherever else I post this, I could really use any kind of help getting this started. So, my name's Mikey, and I've been studying esoterica and occult topics now for about two and a half years. Since the whole pandemic thing happened, that's pretty much all I've been doing. Because I sensed that there was something dreadfully wrong. You could say that it was divine guidance. You could say it was um, just my higher self leading me to things over time. You could say that it was just, uh, you know, humans, human beings evolve through challenge and adversity. That's how we've always evolved. Um you know, natural disasters, wars, uh, things of that nature. And so I think that the, the thing that we went through as an entire world kind of is what sparked this in me. Because I was starting to ask myself questions. I was starting to ask questions on, like, what reality was, uh, where are we really, um... You know, I started looking into various conspiracy theories that led me down rabbit holes that left me asking more questions and more questions. Um, and eventually I started reading the Bible. Um, now, don't click off the video just because I said Bible. The Bible is one of the most prophetic texts that I think exists. Um, and a lot of the things that were prophesied prophesized in the Bible have come true in various iterations throughout time. The book's, you know, 3,000 years old, maybe, somewhere around there. And that's the Old Testament that I'm talking about. And the New Testament hasn't really been around that long. Um, but that's not really what I'm talking about. So through... Through my reading and my discovery, um, I found Gnosticism, which is basically a religious philosophy centered around spiritual and mystic teachings that the Essenes passed down. And not just the Essenes, but various other groups that started coming up out of the ground basically after the death of Jesus. And it led me down various rabbit holes to try to discover what's going on here. What, what are we living inside of? Is this really a floating space rock? You know, are what the, the, the rulers of the world telling us is that the truth, or is there something more to what's going on? And so I started asking questions about the Bible because I had various different versions of it. I had the New International Version. I had the King James Bible and the Revised one. And then I had a couple other versions that I don't have anymore. But I noticed that each and every one of those Bibles said something different. Um... There were edits that were made where entire verses were completely changed. Very important verses that I think um, are some of the most inspiring ones in that book were changed. And so I started asking questions and doing internet searches on what Jesus' religion was. Like what his religion was, what his philosophy was. Because if you read the Bible, you'll see that the New Testament has only four Gospels, which is supposedly the words of Jesus, 
right? And that was it, basically. And then all these other writers came in in the New Testament and were talking about basically like carrying on the legacy almost. And then there were prophecies that were made. There were um, various visions that different mystics were having that were written down, like in Ezekiel. There was a lot going on. And so I was like, visions? What do you mean visions? And that led me down another rabbit hole, and I discovered, you know, meditation and astral projection, which is a very real phenomenon that any human with the capacity to quiet their mind can do. And so that led me down another rabbit hole and led me to the, the phenomenon of the near-death experience or the out-of-body experience. And when I started understanding that, th that these things were real and true, the Bible made a lot more sense to me. And I still had a lot of questions about who Jesus was and what ha really happened to him. And that was when I discovered this. The Nagamati Scriptures. This book is incredible. This book has a lot of the teachings of Jesus in it that were taken out of the Bible that were never put in it to begin with. Um, it tells the story of what really happened with Judas and the um, betrayal that led to Jesus' crucifixion. It has words written by Mary Magdalene. And it gives you more information on the whole Garden of Eden thing. And there's just so much in here. These scroll. This used to be a scroll. Well, various scrolls. And the scrolls were... During a time when... Uh, Jesus's followers were being <clears throat> um, persecuted because of their spiritual beliefs. Just like we know, Jesus was crucified by the Romans or the Catholics, whichever I can't, can't remember. I think it was the Catholics that did it. Or no, was it the Romans? Were the Catholics even a thing yet? Doesn't matter. <laughs> he was he was crucified. Um, and so the, the, uh, group that he belonged to, which was called the Essenes were a mystical order. They were a spiritual order and I would consider them to be Gnostics. No, so what is Gnosticism? So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of what agnostic is. You know, agnostic is basically the belief system where you believe that there could be a higher power or a source, or a creator, or a supreme being that we all come from. Um, but you don't really know or care to know, and you're, you're fine not knowing. And that's what agnosticism is. Gnosticism is the exact opposite of that. We believe that there absolutely is a higher power, or a hierarchy of higher powers, that not control everything, but more like guide everything. Um, and we know uh, through various meditation, meditational practices and astral projections that there are what people would call the angels or the spiritual hierarchies that do communicate with mankind on a regular basis and have been for thousands of years. And so that's, that's in here. Um, see, the, the, the Christian Bible talks about how there are angels and demons. There are, good, there are good angels and bad angels. There are good demons and bad demons. And while this is true, it is not really deeply understood in the Christian fundamentalist religions, such as, um, you know, Protestantism or Presbyterianism or Episcopalianism. Uh, or 
Pentecostals. I think I think the Pentecostals are more open to the idea of higher beings, but they do it. They don't like study it or try to know about it. Um, they do do various religious ceremonies that involve talking in tongues, which is their way of channeling these beings. But I think more of it's it's more of a performance act than anything. I don't know if those people are actually channeling beings. Um, because as far as I know, that that type of work, that type of uh, spiritual practice is incredibly difficult and can really wreak havoc on the mind and the body. So I don't know if Pentecostal Christians are actually communicating with beings. However, they certainly present themselves as that. And, the, you know, they do the dancing and the yelling and the, the talking in tongues. And I'm sure if you looked it up online, you could find it. So there is this coagulated belief that there are higher and lower beings. But in Gnosticism, there, it's more fully explained. It's more explained that there is a set of spiritual hierarchies that as you go up the line, you know, they become more and more unlike human beings and more like just like energy. And I know how crazy that sounds, but I'm, I'm getting to the point that I'm trying to make. If, if you're not into this type of esoteric stuff, try sticking around because you might actually learn something and it might spark something in you to go do your own research into these things. As I've spent, as I said, I've spent two and a half years doing this. So we're going to go back now and we're going to talk about the Essenes a little bit more. The Essenes was a mystical order that basically trained Jesus, that that brought him up within there. You know, people today would call it a secret society. Um, but the Essenes were really all about the development of human consciousness. They were about helping people reach that divine spark that's in all of us so that we can all in the, the short time that we have on, in each incarnation, do something positive for the planet. And that's what the Essenes were. A very, very deep esoteric order that existed for a long time. So, these people brought Jesus up within their their group or their, their church. I guess you could call it a church. I don't really... It's not like a mega church today where, you know, they're handing a hat around and you're supposed to put money in it because that's the way that you buy your way to heaven or some crazy shit like that. Um, it's more that like certain people were allowed in there that really showed the devotion to what people would call the supreme being or God or the source or creator or whatever, whatever term that you want to call it. It doesn't matter to me. It's all the same thing. And if you notice, most religions today have a supreme being and then they have all these little beings that are off of that. Well, this is the same thing in Gnosticism. However, Gnosticism is closely linked with the origins of Christianity. And this is something that not a lot of people know. There are Christians that I've met that say that Gnostics are heretics. When in reality, it's the other way around. And I've noticed this. I've spent a lot of time looking at these things and, and noticing that the Christian churches today are not anything like what Jesus would have wanted. And in fact, it's a complete inversion of his teachings where they teach you to remain in fear your whole life of, of God's punishment um, they tell you you're going to go to hell if you have, if, if you masturbate for Christ's sakes, like they tell you all this crazy stuff and it's really just to push you into submission so that you completely give all of your time and your energy to the church. It's a classic cult tactic, really, it really is. So Jesus was an exalted human being. He was born at a very specific time that had been prophesied prophesized before people knew that this great spirit was coming it wasn't something that was oh oh this baby boy is born let's let's have him be the christ you know it wasn't like that it was a specific astrological alignment that people had been waiting for for a long time and the baby was born 
and this woman named Mary, Mother Mary, who may or may not have been sexually involved with, uh, what's his name? I can't remember. John? Not John. No, it doesn't matter. The, the, the father of Christ, you know what I mean? The, the, in the Christian teachings, they talk about how this woman did immaculate conception where she just was one day graced with the seed of God, you know? And while that is very poetic and divinely inspired, I don't believe that's exactly how it went down. Uh, so Jesus was born to a woman named Mary. And this Mary was a priestess. She was a priestess for the Essenes. And she had been selected to birth the Christ. I'll get into what the definition of the Christ is a little later in the video. I'm going to try not to go too long. This is my first video, but I really want to get this out so people truly understand the, the mysteries behind Jesus. And I think I can do that in 20 minutes or less. Well, 40 minutes or less. So... Jesus was born to this sinless woman who had spent her whole life brought up in the Essenes, you know, learning their ways and, 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 uh, being divinely inspired and, and having a higher self and all those, you know, spiritual things that people talk about nowadays too, in the new age community. And she was chosen. So she had the baby and the story goes that three magi saw a new star born in the sky. Right. And that they traveled, they followed the star to where Jesus was being born. Um, so that's the story. But in reality of it, it's really what they saw was they looked up into the sky and they saw the astrological alignment. And they knew that there was going to be a birth, right, a special birth. And that that birth was Jesus. That was that was Jesus. So he was trained in this in this spiritual order for a very long time he spent most of his young years training he traveled the he traveled the world he went to india he went to all different places india i know for sure he definitely went because there's more than enough writings online and in books to suggest that that he really did travel to india and he studied with the essenes there to learn spirituality, basically, to, to learn how to become more connected to the Divine Mother and the Divine Father. You know, the, the feminine force and the masculine force. The masculine force and the feminine force that basically make up the binary and the duality of human consciousness. So they, they studied, they studied, they studied, and then eventually Jesus came back and started his ministry, which was basically... It was his time now to carry the torch of the Essenes and to bring that more to the public because they wanted to spread their teachings. And Jesus had 12 apostles. That, that much is true. And they each represented one of the zodiac signs of the Western charts. It might have been Vedic astrology because uh, I think they got most of their teachings from India and, and Eastern countries. So it might have been Vedic astrology instead of Western astrology, which is what we in America use. You know how like, like I'm a Gemini in uh, Western astrology, but in Vedic astrology, I'm actually a Taurus. So it's a little different. Um, he came back, he started his ministry and he wanted to get people to be ignited with this divine force and to look upwards Instead of being so down in the dumps about how the world was at the time, instead of looking to every negative possible thing and freaking out about it and just being depressed and, um, you know, living in sin, basically. And when I say living in sin, I mean anything that makes you feel degraded, anything that, that brings your spirit down, anything that, you know, may give you a pick-me-up in the time but ends up making your life worse, that's sin. It's not like, oh, if you're a gay man and you have sex with a man, you're going to hell. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's, that, that is a perversion that has been perpetrated throughout the church since the Protestant movement. But anyways, I go back now. <laughs> it's very important. I think, I think it's really important that people learn these things um, because it kind of makes you understand why the world is the way that it is today. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the time of the crucifixion. 
The story goes in the Bible that Judas betrayed Jesus, right? Sold him out to the Roman soldiers. Yes, it was the Roman soldiers. I thought about that. It is the Roman soldiers. I don't think the Catholics were a thing yet. I think they might have been forming. I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to look into the history a little bit more for that. But basically, he Judas supposedly betrayed Jesus and gave him up to the Roman soldiers for heresy. Because he was going against the, the current church, the, the, the current religion that was sweeping Judea, Galilee, all the, you know, the Greek, uh, Greece and Egypt and all those places. There was a very strong presence that did not want uh, his message getting out because it, it gave people too much power. You know, once you realize that you're a divine being. Once you realize that you have this incredible power and can do these incredible things with your mind, only by using your mind and changing your mindset, it gives you a lot of power. And the, the power structure that was available at the time didn't allow for that. It wanted everybody to be in service to Yahweh. You know, Yahweh, the, the God of this world, right? You know how the Bible talks about how Satan is the God of this world? Well... Yahweh and all his punishments and all the nasty things he would make people do like um god what's his name the guy who was uh supposed to sacrifice his firstborn son on the rock and Ma Mount Sinai I think I can't remember his name doesn't matter Yahweh supposedly tried to test his faith in this god by making him kill his firstborn son. And as he was about to kill his firstborn son, an angel appeared to him, whether it was a physical manifestation or it was just a thought that was put into his head. He's like, this is wrong. Or the angel stopped him or whatever. And the, and the sacrifice didn't go on. And Yahweh had seen that, uh, his faith in him was true, so he left them alone, basically. If Yahweh was the god of this world in the early testament, and then later on in the book it says that Satan was the god of this world, then doesn't it make more sense that Yahweh and Satan are the same person? And this is what, um, are the same being? So this was one of the things that Jesus was teaching, I believe, um, that it was actually an evil god that just wanted you to be a subservient kind of slave to the religious system that had been set up at the time. And so the story goes that Judas betrayed him and brought him to the cross. Basically the Roman soldiers, you know, kidnapped him, brought him to the cross. And there was this whole thing where he was left up on the cross and then he died and whatever. But in reality, when you read the Nagamati codex, that these, these these scrolls that were found in 1945 in a clay pot that were just sitting underground uh, for 2,000 years, it literally says in there that Judas did not betray Jesus. Jesus wanted Judas to do what he did because that was the initiatory right to begin the fucking ritual at Golgotha, which is where he sacrificed himself for humankind. The whole thing was a ritual. The whole thing was a ritual. So Judas, you know, went to the, the Roman soldier. The Roman soldier, you know, gave him some money or whatever. And then he betrayed him, quote unquote. And then he was brought to the cross. And while he's up there, he's in, he's in the hot sun. He's not getting anything to drink or eat. He's bleeding all over himself. You know, and all he can say is, I, I can't remember the exact words that he was saying, but he was basically like, you know, do you not know that you are gods to the people that were watching? Telling people that they themselves were gods. And this is something you can read in, in, the, uh, in the Bible. He literally says that. Um, he had been up there for a while, right? And he wasn't dying. He was holding on for dear life. And then a Roman soldier came by and stabbed him in the rib, right? And he started bleeding out. And as he was bleeding out, he was losing a lot more blood than he had been. 
So when they saw that Jesus was incapacitated completely, they brought him downstairs into the tomb or whatever, right? And there he was resuscitated. Now in the in the in the Bible they say it's the resurrection. But in reality, well, at least this is my belief on this, is that what really happened was he lost just enough blood to go unconscious, but not enough to kill him. And so in that time, he had a near-death experience, which is what everybody talks about when they say he was resurrected. He had a near-death experience and somehow managed to survive because the, the Marys, the, pre the priestesses, were taking care of him. And there actually are doctrines. There's a, there's a group called the Rosicrucians uh, who have found writings as well about how Jesus continued his ministry even after he was resurrected, which leads me to believe that he never died in the first place. And then there was a, I think there was a, a, a temple in Egypt, Luxor, Egypt, that he went to to do divinatory rites after he passed away, or not, not passed away, but after he w was resurrected. Um, so there's those writings as well that people really need to read. But the whole thing, the whole teaching of this has been completely inverted. You know, they want you to believe that Judas, Judas actually betrayed him. They want you to believe that he was just, or they want you to believe that he was God incarnate. They want you to believe that you should worship him. And now there's all these religions that use his image to create a sense of subversion to make people submissive to the church. And like I said earlier, then they, then they send the hat around, the tithing hat. And you're supposed to pay, basically buy your way into heaven. It's totally backwards. This man wanted nothing more than to sacrifice himself for the good of humanity. And because of his, his fight and his willingness to do this, I think that there was some kind of divine intervention there and he was spared so that he could continue his work. Now, like I said, with, with, uh, the invention of modern science, we actually know what the near-death experience is now. We know what it is. Um, and there are countless videos online. I can talk about it in another video if you want, but there are countless videos online of people saying they had out-of-body experiences where they met, you know, angel, the archangel Michael, or, you know, they saw Jesus after they passed away. They, they were, you know, seeing in 360 degrees, but they were dead for 10 minutes. You know, they flatline basically, but then they were brought back and they were given this new lease on life where they believed that their actions actually mattered. And now they're all online trying to get people to understand that the, the veil between us and death is, is not as thin or not as thick as you might think it is. It's actually just a gateway. And this is what the Egyptians taught. This was right around the same time as Jesus was alive. The Egyptians taught that the veil was thin and that you could cross over and come back. You know, you would weigh your heart on the feather, which, which is just a, a metaphor, uh, and you would get your life review. And you would see all of the people that you hurt, all of the decisions you made, good and bad, you know, and that would accumulate together. And so you got this one big message and people would come back people still continue to come back, especially now, more now that we have the technology to resuscitate people and bring people back to life with blood transfusions and all of this crazy allopathic medicine they have today where they can just bring people back to life, you know. There's a certain amount of time when you cross that threshold that you can be resuscitated because the blood in your body only starts to coagulate. I, I think it's like 20 or 30 minutes after you die, your blood starts to break down. But if you can catch that window, then you will survive and you will be brought back and you'll have this crazy experience. Now, what that experience is, is your body actually produces a chemical called DMT or dimethyltryptamine. So 
this dimethyltryptamine is what is released when you dream. It's what it's what is released when you die, when you meditate, when you astral project. And you can also get it from plants to have psychedelic experiences outside of meditation. But the real way to, to create that in your own body is through practice and hard work. And it is a blissful experience. I can, I can attest to that because I've done it. I know exactly how it works and I've been doing it for a while now. It is a wonderful experience. But that to me is what really happened with Jesus is that he did this sacrifice he gave his life. He probably wasn't expecting to come back by any means. He, he, I think, truly believed that he was going to die on that cross. But because of, you know, some kind of divine intervention or some kind of medical technologies that they had at the time, however archaic it might have been, they managed to bring him back. And this is what they call the resurrection. But that, that DMT, dimethyltryptamine, is released in various states of consciousness. Our body is constantly making it. Constantly making it. You know, if you took a, a blood sample from somebody or a brain sample, you would see that DMT is, is in there. Uh, it makes up, you know, a certain percentage of the human body, actually. It's found in animals, specifically penguins. It's found in the mimosa hostilis root bark. Uh, and there's other plants that contain it as well. I think all, I think pretty much all plants contain it to a degree because I think all living things make it or create it in their brains or in their bodies. So truth be told that now that we have the scientific knowledge to understand what the near death ex experience is and what the release of dimethyltryptamine does to the human brain, we can really start looking at the death and rebirth of Jesus Christ in a whole different way. That man studied his whole life to do that one ritual. He spent the time from 30 to 33 literally just meditating on the love of the sun. Like he would sit for hours and just feel like, think about how loving you know, God or the Supreme Being or the Son or, or whatever else was there that would create this form that allows us to experience all of these beautiful, wonderful things, but also incredible hardships. And that was really the true message of Jesus Christ, that he wanted to show people that divine spark. He wanted to get that word out. And the, the power structure that existed at the time did not want that, like I said previously. And there are people on this planet still today that don't want people waking up and realizing their true potential as a human being, as a divine being that's ca ca capable of uh, complex thought, and emotional responses and all these crazy things that can happen with human consciousness. They don't want people waking up to that. Because as soon as people start understanding that they are divine, that they are powerful, that they're beautiful, that they're good people, the whole tide of the planet changes like that. Once people start understanding that, it's a whole nother world. And I think we're beginning to see that world now. And in light of all the... the nasty things that are going on in the world, you know, with the, with the WAR and the, the political correctness and all that crap, there's still beauty to be found in it. When you go walking out in nature, you, you feel that there is some kind of deep connection that you have with the earth. And that is because you are the earth. You are a divine being that has come here specifically for the purpose of evolving, learning, and growing. And that's amazing. That's absolutely beautiful. Like people, I don't think people take enough time to understand that. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about is what the Christ is. So the Christ is a concept that has existed 
for a very long time, even before the birth of Jesus, there were other uh, people that were on the planet that took on this force, this Christ force. Um, it wasn't just Jesus. There were other, you know, savior type beings or savior type people that existed that were in that same stream of consciousness. And they were called Christed or, or Christos or Christos. And it was a Greek term. And it means enlightened one or something to that effect. The enlightened one or the divine one. Um, and that force, the Christ force that is within every single person that exists on the planet is the uplifting evolutionary force that brings people to a heightened state of awareness, a heightened state of uh, complex thought. It is the evolutionary force that pushes humanity to survive throughout all of its challenges, its hardships and adversity that it is presented. That's what the Christ is. Jesus may have been the only person that actually took on the name of the Christ, but there were plenty of other people that came, that incarnated, that were very Christ-like beings. You know, and I'm talking about like India. I don't, I don't know all their names, but I'd have to do another video on that. But there is this force in humanity that wants nothing but up, upliftment that wants to improve the state of things that wants that wants people to be happy and enjoy their lives that does not allow for the fear mongering that was created by you know the people who wrote the original bible those people wanted you to live in fear so that they could live and party so that they could have a great life at the expense of others there have been lots of wars fought about this exact same thing. Nothing has changed. The war that's currently going on is tied into this as well. It's got very deep roots. And there are various organizations on the planet that do not want you to understand what the true meaning of Christ is. And this is why they openly mock him. Because they know you don't have to sit back and worship Jesus. You know, they, they know that that's not something that you have to do in order to make it into heaven. Everybody goes through the same process when they die. And we'll get into spiritual planes and, and all that stuff on later videos if you guys are interested, but... This is just what I've come to learn. Um, and like I said, there's there's so many books that have been taken out of the Bible. This is a this is a book that was found, or the scrolls for this were found in 1945. And look at how much there is in there. You know, those are all writings that never made it into the Bible. And then here is an expanded version. That has all the Manichaean, Mandaean, and Cathar writings in it as well that never made it into the Bible. This is the Apocrypha, which is all about various natural disasters and what caused them and different prophecies that have come to pass already. This was taken out of the Bible. And then you have the Egyptian Coptic Bible, which is called the Colbrin, which has a lot of prophetic imagery in it as well. And that's the, none of these writings ever made it into the Bible either. And then you also have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found in 1947. And these scrolls were hidden by the Essenes to keep them from being destroyed. The Essenes actually hid these, these scrolls to prevent them from getting into the wrong hands. And now we have them. You know how beautiful that is? The fact that that one group decided to put away a copy of these forbidden writings so that one day humanity would once again be able to read them. That is just, it's like a movie. 
you know? It's insanely spiritual. But all of these books have a great amount of information in it. And if you're living your life by the Bible alone and not reading all of the other scriptures that have been written from from then until now, you are missing out big time. Because those books have allowed me to not live in fear anymore. Those books have led me to believe that there are a lot of crazy things that are happening here. And I have my own theories, but that's not what this is about. I just wanted to describe to you basically what Gnosticism was and the Gnostic thought school in general. And I wanted to talk about the Essenes and Jesus. I think I'm going to do another video on Gnosticism so that I can talk about the Manichaeans, the Mandaeans, the Valentinians, the Sethians, and the Cathars. Um... Because I think that that, especially the Cathars, is very important information to have, especially with what happened on January 6th. So, thank you guys for watching. And if you liked it, like the video, comment, subscribe, follow. And I will be back with more of these. And I hope that I gave you just a little bit of inspiration today. And I hope that I opened your eyes to something that was not known because that's the whole purpose of this channel i will be talking about so many incredible things that actually bring a tear to my eye i don't want you to see me cry but um there are a lot of really incredible spiritual texts and groups throughout the world that have inspired me incredibly and i think that uh, more people need to hear their messages because it all, the more people learn about these things, the more we can lift the vibe of the planet and get us out of this weird neo-slavery that we're living in today. But it all starts with, you know, people like you and me. It all starts with coming together and understanding that, you know, we may not know everything and we may never know any everything. But at least we have each other. And if we focus on that love from each other and from source then everything else will be better thanks for watching